It's good to have you here for my second installment on my lecture series on the chemistry of life, organic chemistry and biochemistry. Of course, we're beginning by discussing organic chemistry, what it is, why it is, why it's important, with the hope that many of you guys will be interested enough to go on to take organic chemistry, hopefully from me, because that's sort of why I get paid. <laughs> And I happen to love it because organic chemistry is super cool. In this one, I'm going to teach you a little bit more. Are you ready? Let's get started. So back in chapter 9, to which I'll link right here, you might remember that generally speaking, molecules try to adopt a shape that keeps all of their atoms around them as far away from each other as possible. For example, in the molecule CCl4, or carbon tetrachloride, shown here, uh, the furthest apart that the four chlorine atoms could get on a flat two-dimensional surface like this lecture slide is 90 degrees. In real life, however, these molecules don't exist in a two-dimensional world. They exist in a three-dimensional world. Hence, these chlorine atoms can actually spread out further apart than 90 degrees, as shown here. This shape, incidentally, is called a tetrahedron. You can see in a tetrahedron that chlorine atoms, these green spheres here, can spread out around the central carbon atom, this gray sphere, to have an angle of 109.5 degrees between each chlorine, which is larger than 90 degrees. OK, good. So you might also remember from chapter 9 that these different shapes have names. The three shapes achieved by different carbon atoms with their accompanying names and bond angles are shown here. This is linear, that is carbon atoms that have a 180 degree angle between them. Trigonal planar, that's where the three groups around them have 120 degree angles. And tetrahedral, where there are four groups around a central carbon atom, each having a 109.5 degree bond angle between them, give or take a little, depending on the molecule. Now this idea, the idea that atoms spread out as much as possible and as far away from each other, is called the VSEPR or valence shell electron pair repulsion model. My high school chemistry teacher called it VSEPR because it rolls off the tongue better. VSEPR. And it does apply to carbon bonds. All right, let's see how well you remember this by asking you a couple simple questions. For these molecules right here, what is the bond angle around this carbon atom? What is the name of the shape that it forms? I'm not answering this for you, by the way. I want you to make sure you know how to answer this on your own. How about the same question for this carbon atom and this carbon atom? Can you get it? I hope so. If not, you should definitely make sure that you can before you go on. All right, so you might also remember that back in chapter 9, to which, once again, I'll link right here, we learned that carbon atoms, as well as all other atoms, do something called orbital hybridization when they form bonds. Now, to determine an atom's orbital hybridization, you have to count the number of things around the atom and then memorize the following. Now, before I go on, I have to explain that when I use the word things here, what I'm talking about is uh, either another atom or a lone electron pair. So if your number of things around a central atom is two, then the hybridization is sp. You can count that, two fingers, sp. If the number of things around your central atom is three, then it's going to be s. P2. If the number of things around your central atom is 4, then its hybridization is going to be S, P3. Make sense? Now, if you want to learn more about this subject in greater detail, I invite you to watch uh, from about 12 minutes and 36 seconds to about 16 minutes and 40 seconds of the following link here, uh, which is a separate video from my YouTube channel talking in depth about the subject. Now, having watched that, and hopefully you actually did, Let's see if you can answer this question. What is the hybridization of each of the indicated atoms? I'm not answering it for you. I'll let you answer it on your own. Now, what are the indicated bond angles here? Once again, I'm not answering it for you. I'll let you answer it on your own. That takes us then to a beautiful lecture video question. I want you to determine the hybridization of each atom in the following molecule. As per usual, I am not going to do this for you, but invite you to do it on your own. Now, for those students who are taking this class from me, if you want to know the answer, you're welcome to ask me in class. Okay, now there's one more thing I need to tell you. Hydrocarbons, which are molecules that just have carbon and hydrogen in them, that have all carbon-carbon single bonds in them are called alkanes. Hydrocarbons that have carbon-carbon double bonds in them are called alkenes, while hydrocarbons that have carbon-carbon triple bonds in them are called alkynes. And you can see that all shown right here, an alkane, an alkene, and an alkyne. Please make sure that you memorize that because the names are sort of important in the world of organic chemistry. Now, alkanes have the general formula CnH2n plus 2. 
Now, if you doubt me, you can go ahead and put in one right there for N. There's only one carbon right here and see if the number for H actually comes out to be four, the formula of this molecule. If you do the same thing for any alkane that doesn't have any rings in it at least, that formula works. Now alkenes have the general formula of CnH2n. Alkynes have the general formula CnH2 minus n. So as you can see, each time we add a double bond, it decreases the number of hydrogens by two. Now the same thing turns out to be true if you add a ring, as in a cycloalkane. So if I add a ring, if you count the total number of hydrogens, keep in mind that there are two hydrogens coming off of each one of these carbons. It also decreases the total number of hydrogens by two relative to what you would have if you didn't have a ring. I hope that's all clear. Anyway, so each time we add a double bond or a ring, we call it a degree of unsaturation. Each degree of unsaturation decreases the number of hydrogens by two. Thus, we could say that the number of degrees of unsaturation, or number of double bonds or rings, is equal to A minus B divided by two, where A is the number of hydrogen atoms that your compound would have if it didn't have any double bonds or rings, and B is the number of hydrogens that your compound in question actually does have. Now, just so you know, any hydrocarbon that has all single bonds in it, no double or triple bonds, is said to be completely saturated, as in the case of saturated fats. They're fats that contain no carbon-carbon double or triple bonds. So this figure, which is figure 24.1 from our text, reemphasizes the bond angles, molecular geometries, bond types, and hybridizations achieved by different hydrocarbon molecules. Just for you to review. Now to another subject. As we also discussed back in chapters 8 and 9, to which I'll link here, when there is a significant difference in electronegativity between two bonding atoms, their bond will be polar. The polarity of entire molecules, however, is a little bit more complicated. An entire molecule's polarity is a product of both the polarities and the geometries of all of its individual bonds kind of together as a whole. So how do we determine if a molecule is polar or not? We follow these steps. One, we draw the molecule's Lewis structure. Two, as best as we can, we redraw the Lewis structure to show the molecule's overall molecular geometry. Three, we draw arrows between every single atom in the molecule going from the less electronegative atom, A, to the more electronegative atom, B, in each bond like this. And four, we answer the truck question, which I'll explain by using our next example. Predict whether each of the following molecules is polar or nonpolar. Now, I'm not going to embed my explanation, including my explanation involving the truck question, right here into this video. Instead, I'll link to a separate video in which I do, and I beg you, please make sure, if you don't already know this stuff, to click on this link and watch the explanation. Okay, one last subject for this video, at least. That of line bond structures. Before I go on any further, I have to explain something very important. We organic chemists use a shorthand way of drawing carbon-carbon bonds, which we call line bond structures. It's sort of like a lazy shorthand way because I don't want to draw out all the hydrogens and everything. It takes forever. So the way this works is instead of drawing the letter C for each carbon atom, we draw a single point. Single bonds are then drawn as straight lines between two points or two carbon atoms. Double bonds are drawn as two straight lines and so forth. Hydrogen atoms aren't drawn. We instead assume that each carbon atom has as many hydrogen atoms attached to it as is needed for it to attain four total bonds. All atoms other than carbon or hydrogen are written in as the atom's letter symbol. Jokingly, an old organic chemistry professor of mine in grad school once said that to be an organic chemist, the only skill you need is to be able to count to four. Let me show you this a little bit further. This molecule right here, which is called hexane, if I draw it all out in the longhand structure, I've got to draw all of these bonds between all the carbons and the hydrogens. It just takes forever. The line bond structure, in contrast, looks like this. Keep in mind, each of these points is a carbon atom. I don't draw hydrogen atoms on the carbon atoms. I just assume that they're there, as many as are necessary, in order to have each carbon atom achieve four total bonds. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbon atoms, that's hexane. Here's another example. This molecule where I've got an alternating double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. This molecule, incidentally, is called benzene. If I draw it in line bond structure format, it looks like this. A cute little ring, each of these are carbon atoms, the hydrogen atoms are completely left out. How about this one, where I've got carbon atom double bonded to oxygen with its cute little lone pairs here. I've got a CH3 on the left and a CH3 flanking it on the right. 
I can draw this molecule called acetone, the primary ingredient fingernail polish remover, as this. Carbon, carbon, carbon. And notice that often we completely omit the lone pairs on our oxygen atom unless we really want to show them because we're lazy like that. Organic chemistry, the world of shorthanded laziness. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, let's take a look at some problems. I want you to convert the following molecular formulas into line bond structures. And next, draw the line bond structures for each of the molecules described in these three parts. Now, I'm not going to answer these questions for you here, but I invite you to do them on your own. But please make sure that you attempt them and get your head wrapped around them because I think it will be very important. That takes us to the end of this video. Please stay tuned to the next video in which I'll begin by teaching you about polarity or non-polarity of hydrocarbons. Until next time, students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.